Did you know that Bitcoin uses as much energy as some entire countries? Bitcoin has a massive network of miners called ASICs that require a lot of energy to mine and secure the Bitcoin network. So for Bitcoin to be successful, it's critical to have access to cheap and reliable energy. That's why miners are moving in flocks to Texas and running their mining operations off of natural gas wells, wind turbines, solar farms, and on-grid applications. But up to now, there hasn't been a place for Bitcoin miners and energy producers to connect with each other. That's why Digital Wildcatters is bringing everyone to the energy capital of the world, Houston, Texas, for two days of network and learning at the premier mining event and power. Maybe you're an experienced miner or energy producer that's looking for partnerships, or maybe you're new to the space and you want to learn and get your foot in the door. There's going to be content and opportunities for people from all different backgrounds. March 30th, the 31st, Houston, Texas, and power. Get more information at digitalwildcatters.com. I, 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 Hey everybody, welcome to Chuck Yates Needs a Job, the podcast. This is kind of cool. This is, I think, my first international podcast. So as we branch out here at, uh, at Chuck Job, I'm honored to have on Tabitha Lasley as our guest. Hey, Tabitha, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm good. So, Tabitha, I'm going to kind of set up this story a little bit. But I want you to take it over really quickly because I want to hear your take on it. So Tabitha is in London. She's a journalist. She decides to go to the North Sea, interview offshore workers. Kind of the premise is what happens when the girls aren't there. So she's going to kind of create a book or an article or a research piece, whatever you want to call it, of content about offshore workers, their psyche, what's going on. She flies to Northern Scotland. She starts interviewing people. And then, holy cow, you go all sex in the city on us and shit gets real. So take it over. Tell, tell us about the book. And let me, let me say this real quick. The book's name is Sea State. Well, the book is really about failure, I think. I mean, it was a failed project. You know, I was actually qualified to go offshore myself. Um, in Britain, we have a course we have to do. You probably have something equivalent in America, the BOSIET, which is an insurance thing um, where you basically get trained, you know, what to do if your helicopter crashes, what to do if you're in a burning building, that sort of thing. So I'd done all of that. And by the time I got out there, um, the industry was going through a recession. Uh, it was just after the crash of 2014. Um, so I failed to, um, you know, execute my original project. And I really think I failed to find out what men were like, no women around because I was around. So there was a kind of Schrodinger effect of the observer um, influencing the outcome. Um, so the book is about failure of all sorts, really. It's about a failed affair that never quite gets off the ground. It's about um, the failure of me to kind of make any... Um, sort of put down any roots in London, make any impact on my field. And I sort of return um, back to the Wirral, which is where I'm from, uh, with my tail between my legs and um, take a job working in a chicken shop in a refinery town. Um, and that's it, basically. And I think it's important to say that embedded in the book is the ghost of the book that it could have been. And I think, I think it was Alan Bennett who said that every book is stalked by the ghost of its original idea, paraphrasing, but, and there is sort of um, echoes of, of the original book in there, you know, there's, there's excerpts from the transcripts at the beginning of each chapter. Um, so, so there's a sort of shadow book almost embedded in the actual book. So I'm going to make us go salacious first and we'll handle that. But then there's a lot of serious stuff I want to unpack about the book, but salacious first, I mean, what, the first guy you meet, you wind up having a torrid affair with? Yeah, and I think it was really important to say that he was the first. Originally, I think in one draft of the book, um, it got changed sort of in the editing process. But in the, I think in the, in the first draft of the book, we actually had the number interview um, next to each chapter. So, you know, one, nine, 42, because I wanted to make the point that had he been number nine or number 42 or number 56 or 78, that affair wouldn't have happened. 
it was because he was the first. He was almost the first man I'd spoken to um, after leaving this relationship I leave at the beginning of the book. And I think that when a man is nice to you after you've had, you know, a really rotten relationship, that has a very powerful effect. And often women um, can get into, um, you know, really, um, I don't know, uh, really uh, sort of, unwise situations if they if they if they come out of a relationship like that and they don't take any time on their own you know you're sort of low-hanging fruit for predatory people I would say and that's why um I have made the point in every interview since that he was the first person pretty much that I spoke to okay that's interesting because I read the book and yeah you're coming off the bad relationship in London I I think part of doing the book and you tell me otherwise was just, I got to get the hell out of here. I mean, and I, I understand that I went through a, a divorce several years ago and I moved back to my small hometown that I grew up in just so I could hang out with people that I met, I knew before I was 18. So I, I get that. So I think part of, I'm going to go write this book I'm gonna quit my job, go do it was definitely got to get the hell out of here. This relationship's horrible. Because the thing I did not get from the book when I was reading it and see, I'm a God fearing Texan. So it's just horrific to me that I would actually agree with the New York Times. But their review of your book said, what did you see in this Caden guy? I mean, we don't get it. And that's what I was sitting there thinking, too. The whole time I'm reading it, I'm like, nice guy. But really, I'm going to go mess around with married man and all those issues and ex-wives and all that sort of stuff that you were kind of dealing with. But I didn't feel that you love the guy. Well, I think that's a, it is a good point. And it's a point that um, a lot of people have made since the book was published. Um, and it's why I put that first relationship, the re relationship that I left in, because I thought the context was really necessary to understand. You know, when you've been in a terrible relationship for years and years and years, um, you'll take what you can get. And I think the thing about Caden was he almost had no personality. So if you think about falling in love as, you know, it's just a process where you project your shit onto, you know, the first person you meet, or not exactly the first person you meet, but you know, you will project your shit onto the next person you're with. And the relationship will last if once you find out the real them, you you can live with them. But then very often you can't because there is a huge gulf between the real person and this template upon whom you've projected all your issues. And the thing about Caden is because he almost had no personality of his own, he was very, very easy to project onto, but it did present a technical challenge with the book because it was like, how do I, how do I make this person who has no personality seem appealing? And obviously I didn't, I didn't manage because um, so many people have said since yes, but what did you see in him? We can't see what you saw in him. Um, so it is another of the book's failures. But I don't know that I necessarily view it as a failure because at the end of the day, it made me more interested in the story. You know, it's kind of like I wanted I wanted to do this podcast. I wanted to talk to you because I was kind of like she obviously had something intense going on. You don't deal with an ex-wife or a wife flaming you every day unless there's something intense there. I just didn't think it was him, you know. I think it was just like you say, the need to escape, the need to find a kind of shoot to get out of London and my old life, which really wasn't working anymore. Um, you know, he was just a kind of, I think he was a kind of conduit into a new type of life because I was really, really eager to get away from my old life. Um, and he sort of presented a way out. Gotcha. No, that's, you know, that, that, um, I mean, my running joke is I've spent more on therapy than the gross national product of a third world country. You know, I kind of went went through the uh, the separation and the divorce. And, yeah, I had like 12 different therapists and read every Brene Brown book and all that. But I think one of the things that always stuck with me is one of my therapists said, hey, Chuck, the grass is never greener. You know, you and Kim had a great marriage for a long time but you broke up, guess what? You're going to have the same problems with the next relationship unless we fix you, you know? So don't sit there and think, you know, it was Kim's fault. You got to look inside and go, okay, what's wrong with me? Peel back the onion 
and start working on that stuff or you're going to repeat it. And so I almost did feel like reading the book that you were doing some of that in the relationship with him. So it's interesting to hear you say he's a black blank canvas. I could project on him my art, but it did feel like you were painting a new you on him. Did I get that right from the book? Yeah, I think I think a lot of the time, I think a lot of people harbor the kind of secret wish to move somewhere where they know no one. I don't think that's unusual um, to want to do that, to just pack your shit up and go and go somewhere where nobody knows your name and start again. But of course, wherever you go, there you are. You haul your problems with you. And I did feel for the first few weeks I was in Aberdeen. Oh, look, I'm a completely new person. I've got this new flat. And it's, I've got, you know, because the housing situation um, in Aberdeen is completely different from the one in London. You know, it was really a buyer's market up there because everybody was clearing out because of, um, you know, the, re the recession. And so, and it was, it was so weird to me that I could get up there and for £800 a month, I could have a whole flat to myself. Whereas in London, you know, there was a massive housing crisis going on at the time and £800 a month would barely buy you a box room in a shared house. So my situation felt really different and, you know, I didn't have to go into work. I'd sort of divested myself of all the last forms of authority. I didn't have a boss anymore. I didn't have a boyfriend anymore. It was really freeing. But then after a few weeks, you know, um, I think the effect of the sort of newness of the situation sort of wore off and I, I started noticing that actually all the same things were happening again. Yeah, I've talked about it a bunch on the, the podcast, which is kind of weird for an oil and gas uh, podcast, but you know, kind of at its core, when we feel bad about ourselves, our bad behavior, all of that, I think Brene Brown got it right. She attributes it all to ultimately your 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 shame that you're feeling is you feel unworthy of love and uh, easy for bad relationships, et cetera, et cetera, to put you in that spot. And it leads to Hey, I'm going to go have an affair with a married man. I'm going to go do a lot of drugs. I'm going to go somewhere, try to reinvent myself and, uh, and the like. The thing that Brene Brown says, and I've come to believe, and I'm going to throw it out as a statement, but critique it given your own experiences. You know, at the end of the day, shame hates words. The only way to get rid of the shame you're feeling is to share it. And that's your best friend. It's your priest. It's a therapist. It's something. But at least that's kind of Brene's take on how we get past things like that is actually sharing, talking it through, et cetera. And so I wonder what you think about that kind of given what you what you went through. So I think it's really interesting that you have um, picked up on the word shame um, because when this book was optioned, um, they initially contracted this brilliant scriptwriter um, called Jen Micah, who I think out of anyone I've ever spoken to about the book had the best understanding of it. And I remember saying to her, we went up, back up to Aberdeen because she'd never been there. And I remember saying to her, you know, about my father who um, had, has died um, since the events of the book and saying to her, he was the most shame filled person I ever knew. And he wanted everybody to feel ashamed too because he was full of shame and the book was a kind of repudiation of that because it was it's a really shameless act um to go in and write up those things and she said that's so weird because i think the book is all about shame i think it's full of shame i think it's one of the most shame-filled books i've ever read it's about a, a person who is full of shame and can't get past it so it's interesting that that you settle on that word and i, th I do think Brene brown has got some really interesting ideas um although i would say that I think that with Brene, it's like, it, it's kind of like, it's only really applicable to people who have money and choices, her kind of brand of, I don't even know what you'd, you'd call her sort of, um, her theories. Um, it, it's almost like, you know, I guess kind of, I don't know, what would you call it? Uh, that's like a good, you know, I hadn't thought through, I hadn't really thought through the, you need money to be able to implement what Brene's saying. Um, and maybe, you know, I'm, I'm one of those that grossly oversimplifies everything, um, and probably miss half the point on stuff, but yeah, no, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't, 
Yeah, I had. I need to go think about that one in terms of because I'd ask you kind of what do you mean? Because I would have said at its very core what Brene Brown's saying is, hey, go tell somebody. Once you tell somebody and you hear the words "me too," because ninety nine percent of the time the person you choose to tell is one of your most trusted folks on the planet, they're going to support you. I mean, you know. And so they come back and say, me too. That's kind of like half the battle. What do you, what do you think in terms of taking money? What does that mean to you? I don't think it costs anything um, to be vulnerable and to share your problems. Um, I think that bit of Brene's um, work is free, but I just think a lot of her ideas about work, about management, um, they are, they are applicable only if you are on a solid footing in the world already you know if you've got the job with healthcare if you've got pension if you've got benefits you know then you can start I guess sort of it's like Maslow's hierarchy of need isn't it you kind of need to be halfway up it already to apply a lot of Brene Brown's ideas about work about honesty you know it's whereas I mean I think I think until you've got those bases covered you can't really um you know it's sort of her her ideas about honesty it's like if you're a poor person, um, you probably don't have the room for, to maneuver, you know, to be sort of radically honest with, with people in your life. Do you see what I mean? It's just, you know, you're going to be making, if you're poor, you have to make compromises every single day. You can only sort of embrace this radically honest and uncompromising life if you're, you know, if you're halfway up Maslow's Triangle already, you know, if you've already got, you know, a house, a pension, a secure income. That's what I mean. It's sort of it's therapy for people who are solidly middle class already, I would say. OK, this is uh, this is interesting because um, I made a Twitter thread, call it a week ago, six days ago, something like that, where I basically said, hey, oil and gas guys, now is not the time to spike the football and run around and say, I told you so. We're going to be making a lot of money here at one hundred and thirty dollar oil. Let's show empathy because people in America truly are suffering. There's a single mom out there struggling to fill her gas tank. And I wrote this whole thread about it. It's, you know, let's kill people with kindness. Exxon, Chevron, Shell, let's announce the program of we're going to help, you know, poor people get gasoline for their cars, heat their homes, you know, this winter, or even though winter is almost over, but heat their homes, et cetera. And my whole reason for saying that is I just think we as an industry have been pretty obnoxious when we're doing well. When oil's, you know, $100 a barrel, we drive a Lamborghini. And what we've missed, I think, is the higher energy prices generally put the rest of the world into recession. So people are suffering a lot while we're doing well. And instead of showing empathy for that historically, we'll go get a Lamborghini and we'll put a bumper sticker on it that says freeze a Yankee, you know? And so I was trying to make that point where I'm going with this is somebody last night on Twitter came back and said, Hey Chuck, you're in no position to lecture us about compassion. You got to ride off in the sunset. Yeah, it's bad. You got fired, but come on, Chuck, you're not going to starve. And they made the exact point you just made. And I'm going to be sitting here probably all week thinking through, okay, was I really going through all that therapy? Was I really finding myself? Was I really, I think, becoming a better person? I guess that's for others to say. Was it because I wasn't worried about whether I was going to starve or not? Well, I mean, the, you know, I think for a start, in order to get therapy and hours and hours of therapy, you have to have like a, a, your base needs covered don't you? I mean, you can't spunk all your money on therapy if you can't eat and heat your home. But it's interesting what you say about oil men um, not empathizing with people when times are good. So I think the exact opposite is also true because people love um, seeing their petrol prices really low at the, at the tanks. And they never think about what that means for oil workers. You know, in 2014, 15, petrol here was really cheap and people were really pleased about it. And they never thought, well, what does that mean for the people are getting it out the ground. It means rounds and rounds and rounds of layoffs. It means whole towns in Scotland in the northeast of England um, suffering because, you know, there are certain rigs in the North Sea that are outposts of towns on land. You know, the whole 
of the male population of certain towns will work on certain rigs. So, you know, it's a two-way street. I think the two groups don't really think about each other. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's definitely what we've seen. And kind of layer on top of that, the folks that are getting cheap gasoline and getting an Amazon package delivered to their house, right? Because I guarantee you all those Amazon delivery vans are not running around the last 10 years if oil would have averaged $100 a barrel. The fact oil averaged 45 or $50 a barrel is why I always jokingly say that Amazon should be paying the windfall profits tax and not the oil and gas business because they're the ones that benefited from all the uh, the cheap oil. Um, but if you layer kind of on top of that, we're not thinking about each other. We're not thinking about each other's suffering. There is, I think, some justified bitterness from the oil and gas community in terms of, hey, we do do a lot of good things. And y'all run around and say, we're killing the planet. We're destroying the planet. Yet at the same time, every single thing you're using right now is made out of petroleum. You're running around having cheap gas in your car, et cetera. And so there is just a lot of pent up anger over on this side. And I think part of my tweet was I was channeling my inner Obi-Wan Kenobi from Star Wars in terms of just don't turn to the dark side, you know, <laughs> use the force, stay on, <laughs> stay on the good side. Don't turn to the dark side because our hate will consume us and us spiking the football and uh, that's an american term by the way this thing we have called football that's really football not that stuff y'all have over in england we spike the football when we score a touchdown but anyway i just i just uh it's 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 interesting to hear you say that because you're right i mean we uh it, it's almost like a relationship someone has to go first and do the right thing to change the behavior of the other side and i hope in this period of prosperity that oil and gas is going to have, I hope we actually choose to do the right thing, show empathy, be benevolent. And we're not going to win over all our critics, but at least some, there's a big middle there that wouldn't necessarily hate us in the absence of other things. The days of oil field workers wasting countless hours lost, searching for pump jacks and well pads in a maze of unmapped lease roads are over. Well Site Navigator, the most downloaded oil field mobile app ever, now offers turn-by-turn -turn directions to over one million wells through lease road navigation technology. We've mapped tens of thousands of miles of lease roads you can't find anywhere else, and we're always adding more. With our reliable directions, oil field workers can drive right to the well site and share custom routes and locations and get more done each day. Try Well Site Navigator for free and get a $10 Amazon gift card for every friend you send us. Don't get lost. Get Well Site Navigator. What I'm hoping for in this boom period is for um, workers to learn the lesson of the industry, which they never seem to, which is that it's a volatile commodity and the volatility is mirrored by industry practices. You know, it's a hire and fire kind of industry. Just put some of your money away. Like every oil worker I know, as soon as they start hiring again, like frisses away his money on nonsense. And then, you know, the price drops again and people start getting laid off again and they have no savings. They have nothing to pay the tax bill with. It seems to me that oil is such a short sighted industry and that culture trickles down. You know, the oil companies themselves are really short sighted in the hiring practices and the firing practices. And that makes the workers really short sighted in terms of like the personal finance. So we have a town in Texas uh, called Midland, and it's the heart of the Permian Basin. So probably a decent parallel to, uh, to Aberdeen, if you will. And very early in my career, 25 years ago, I was out there at the Petroleum Club having lunch, and I'm sitting at a table with nine guys that their collective, their average age was probably 85. I mean, just all these old oil and gas guys been in the business the whole time. And I said that exact question. I'm like, hey, why don't y'all save some money in the good times and then you'll have some in the bad times? And uh, they were like, oh, hell, it's a lot more fun to spend it. And, you know, those guys just sat there and said, you know, that's about the time I lost my third company. And then I lost my fourth company. That was a great one. You know, but I had a lot of fun. I had two jets with the fifth one. And I just think 
I think so. So that I came home and was like telling my parents, going, "Holy shit, mom and dad! I have no idea who these people are." But I think where it comes from is you have to be the biggest optimist on the planet to go spend whatever you spend drilling a well, right? Like an onshore well in West Texas will cost ten million dollars. So you're going to go spend ten million dollars, and then you turn the tap on, and you're like. You turn the tap on and you're like, oh, my God, let's see what we have now. You know, so you spend all the money up front and then you get the 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 results back and they can be really crappy. So I think there's some selection bias just in the industry of you got to be willing to kind of have that that optimistic bent and an optimistic bent when you get a hundred thousand dollar bonus check, go buy a Lambo. You know, I mean, it's yeah, definitely. And I think as well as this like feeling that you know, their working lives, you know, when you're doing a sort of two or three week rotation, their working lives are so not fun that they've somehow earned the right to spend all their money when they get back. But, you know, it's their money at the end of the day. They're stealing from themselves. They're stealing from their future selves. You know, I've got a friend who um, has worked in oil for 20 years and uh, he's getting divorced at the moment. And we went out for a drink the other night and he told me that at one point he was earning 12000 pounds a month which is I don't know what that is in dollars maybe like seventeen thousand dollars a month I said did you save any of it he said no no <laughs> I thought I'd never heard to him to put any of that money away yeah it's a cultural thing one I think there's one other point to play into this and I want to make sure I say this with the amount of love and reverence that I'm of the people in the oil field that I say this about because I really do I always tell people, oil and gas people, greatest people on the planet. They're the most generous, giving planet. I mean, I don't think a charity in Houston, Texas went bust, even though we went through minus $37 oil. I mean, people really do cut checks. But, you know, it's interesting. And this is this is a lot Michael Patrick Smith, the, uh, the author that introduced us. It's kind of his theory, so I'm stealing a little bit. The Marine Corps particularly the Navy SEALs, when they're looking for recruits, they actually go through and try to find people that had incredibly traumatic childhoods because those people ran on adrenaline their whole life. So if you're going to go in and have to shoot up the Taliban on the side of a mountain in Afghanistan, you're going to have to run with adrenaline. You're going to have to be able to deal with it. And they found that childhood trauma folks do that. I I don't want to equate it too much, but to some degree, there's some solem- sol- similarities in that the oil field is tough. I mean, you can die at any moment. There's big equipment flying over your head at every given second. There's a lot of adrenaline out there. And at least what Michael Patrick Smith said when he was out in the, the field for about a year is a lot of the folks out there had traumatic childhood, you know, problems with their fathers, problems with their mothers, this event and that. And so, you know, to some degree, when you've had you've had childhood trauma, you're more willing as an adult to take risk, not consider consequences, et cetera. Did you get a sense for that? Any any feel of that when you were interviewing these guys? Yeah, definitely. I think there's several separate points there. Um, First of all, certainly in Britain, um, a lot of people um, who work offshore have got a forces background. So there's a great deal of crossover there anyway. Um, you know, people who've worked in the forces are used to performing under pressure. They're used to rank structure and taking orders. And they're used to working in, you know, sort of far flung locations and living in cramped conditions and being away uh, from their families for long periods of time. So it's really a perfect kind of um pipeline, if you like, into the oil and gas industry. Um, I also think it's really interesting that, that I didn't know that about the um, Navy recruitment, but if you think about it, it's also a bit like gangs, like, isn't it, that they try and recruit people um, with traumatic childhoods because they've got no loyalty. So their loyalty will be to the gang. And I'm sure that the same mechanism happens um, with people in the forces, that you will have more loyalty um, to, um, you know, whichever, whichever arm of the forces you join if you've got nothing waiting for you at home. And that's why as well, like, you know, they will try and break 
your attachment to home a lot of the time. And they, the men will do that to each other as well. Um, offshore, you know, um, certainly in the British oil industry, there's this um, trope, Leroy. Leroy is the man who hangs around at home waiting for you to go so he can have sex with your wife. And it's, it's a bit like the kind of Jody calls, you know, that Marines used to do. It's a means of kind of, um, I think, um, breaking that attachment to home so your head will be at work because your head needs to be at work in those conditions. You know, and I think with most, we were talking about this before we started recording the podcast, but I think most things, energy business, we're just 15 years behind the rest of the world on everything. Pick anything you want to talk about. We're generally behind, except latest and greatest technology that allows us to find more oil. We do that really well. But at the end of the day, whether it's mental health type issues, anything else, you know, we're just way behind um, kind of the times. But I will say this, that's been one of the things interesting about this podcast. I've talked a lot about mental health on it. Uh, we've had a lot of guests come on and get really real about things. One private equity investor came on, talked about going through testicular cancer. Another investor came on, talked about just blowing up a, a hedge fund, not having it turn out like he liked and just was real and owned it. Um, had a, another oil and gas professional come on and talk about the the really dark place he was in during the pandemic and and the like. And I think there's something that we need to do, but I don't know what it is to sit there with oil field folks so that they can share, get the benefits of some sort of therapy, if you will, just for the better of everyone. And I think oil fields 15 years behind everyone. I think the pandemic has sped that up. And I think, you know, half half the industry losing their job has kind of sped that up and people are more willing to be real. But uh, I think I think we need solutions there. I'm just not sure what they are. I think one of the things would be um, really to look at the structure of the accommodation offshore. Um, I remember a trade union um, official saying to me um, when I was up there that in the early 90s, they put um, TVs in everybody's cabin. I mean, now people will just have devices. And he said that it looked like they were being nice by doing that, but actually it was a very deliberate corporate ploy to break up the men in the evenings. So they didn't get to sit and talk to each other and talk over problems and maybe, um, you know, sort of in the company's mind, sort of start collective action. They split them all up. And what that meant really was that mental health problems offshore spiraled because everybody was just going back to their room at night and sitting by themselves. And, you know, we're not made to do that. We're not made to, um, you know, each, each sort of retire to, to our cave at night and not have any social contact, especially when you're in such an isolated environment anyway. You know, you're out in this structure in the, the middle of the sea, no land in sight, no home comforts, and then you just go back to your cabin at the end of the night, or at the end of the day rather, day, night, whatever shift you're working, and you don't talk to anyone. That's that's so bad for your mental health. But I think that was quite a deliberate um, tactic on behalf of the companies. They don't want people to, um, I don't think they want people to sort of um, function as a, as a team because functioning, you know, as a team means that they might unionize, that they might strike. And that's not good from the company's perspective. Yeah. No. I, and again, that points to oil and gas being 15, 20 years behind everyone else. I think when you look at the technology folks, and we can talk all day about the evils of Facebook or Google or Twitter, but at least cultural wise, they have figured out that mental health of our employees matter uh, people today don't have this big, huge brick wall. Here's my personal life. Here's my work life. Never the two shall meet. I mean, people, people in this world who grew up on Instagram or Facebook and just live their lives out loud are searching for fulfillment on the emotional level wherever they go. And that includes work. And if you're not addressing it there, guess what? Uh, they're not going to want to work there. And, you know, oil's been such a boom and bust. We had this down cycle where we uh, we got rid of a lot of people. 
my hope is that on this cycle on the way up, as we start uh, hiring folks, we actually take that into consideration of, okay, we're going to pay somebody a salary, but we're also going to make it a great place to be. So they're going to want to be here. Because I, I will say this, the the conservatives in the United States say the reason we don't have more people working today is because of the government was paying them pandemic checks. I think there's some truth to that, but I also think there's a lot more truth to the fact that people just reexamined life. You know, you went through the pandemic. It's a shit show. I'm example number one. I told my parents three days ago, I'd rather move back in with y'all before I get another job because working sucks. Yeah, it does. I completely agree. And I think a lot of people have come around to that way of thinking. They like not having to commute. They like not having to force themselves out of bed at seven in the morning and try and make themselves look presentable before sitting down to work. And also, I think the jig is up for companies who insist that you've got to be at a desk to do your work a desk in their building. You know, now that we've all been forced to work from home, there is no excuse for companies to force you back into the office. So I think it's been a it's been a reassessment for everybody really, and I think it's a good thing. Yeah. No, I, I think ultimately it'll it'll uh, wind up being a good thing too. I think I think we'll have mixed emotions 10 years from now. We'll look back and we're going to kick ourselves for what we did for our children. I mean, we scared the shit out of our kids. For really no reason. I mean, a pandemic, yes, it's bad, but it really was isolated in terms of who affected, who who got affected by it. It was unfortunately elderly people and overweight people that wind up suffering the brunt for it. And, you know, to put our kids through what we did, we're going to kick ourselves. But then I think on the flip side, too, is we're going to realize that, hey, during that period, you know. I texted Chuck and Chuck was there for me and Chuck and I have a new bond that we never had before. And, and that, and then hopefully our companies see that and they become more proactive about setting the, the stage for stuff. I think as well, we've got to remember that a lot of our ideas about work are actually grounded in religion. There's nothing, um, you know, morally superior about working hard. Not really. I mean, we, we think there is because we're from a Puritan culture, but I'm right. I'm, I'm very lazy. You know, I will try and get away with doing the least I can to get the same result every day. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. No, I kind of the same way I say the same thing about the pandemic is I figured out I like the toys, but I don't need the toys. I can tell you that, you know, if uh, if you walked in and said, hey, here goes high paying but high stress job and you can go get a private jet i'd be like nah i'm gonna go back and make my podcast (laughs) you know so and i think a lot of people are coming around to that way of thinking that actually there's no point breaking your back to work in any field if you're not well enough to enjoy the fruits of your labor you know if you're making yourself ill by accruing all this stuff what's the point yeah so give us the biggest kind of I'm going to say biggest, but also unexpected sort of thing you learned from writing the book. What was, what was kind of, I mean, I, I'm going to, the cliche and, and I'm sure it's true is it was very therapeutic for you, put you in a much better place, et cetera. Something beyond that, that uh, popped out from writing the book. I think probably the thing I learned that has been most useful is I think everybody, um, tends to apply narrative principles to their lives, but writers more especially. So you're always looking for a reason why things have happened. And I was always like, oh, well, this awful thing happened, but then it led me to this or it led me to that. And, you know, I was always trying to impose a narrative structure on my life. Um, Doing this book taught me not to do that. You know, you can only make sense of things sort of afterwards. but, it does, but, you know, life is just a, a series of um, random sequences. And, um, yeah, and there's no inherent meaning to them. Is that a bit depressing? I mean, that's, that's what I found from writing the book, that you can try and force it into a narrative shape if you want. Um, but, you know, it won't hold. You know how I look at that? Because um, I, no, I feel exactly what you're saying there. The way I look at it is when you start off your life, you're a kiddo probably up to call it 35 or 40. And I think this is what you just said and what you're going through is up until that point, your life is a biography. 
it's about you, but you're not writing it. Your teachers are writing it. Your parents are writing it. Your boss is writing it. And then at about age 35 or 40, one day your boss says something and you tell your boss to kiss off or you tell your boss to jump in a lake and the end of the world does not happen. You don't get fired and you realize you have some sort of power. And every day that goes by, you have a little bit more power, a little bit more power, and it converts into an autobiography. Then you figure out you're writing this. And the struggle of the responsibilities you took and the, the way you have to live your life in the biography phase and transforming that into the autobiography phase that's the middle life, midlife crisis. That's whatever. And, and that's that's kind of the struggle we all have to go through at that point. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think as well, like the flip side of that is getting older and more confident um, means that you lose confidence in other people. Like I no longer trust anybody to do anything, especially with my work, with my writing. I'm horrible to work with. I'm horrible to edit because as I've grown older and become more confident and more convinced that I'm good at my craft, I just think that people don't know what they're doing anymore. You know, the more you, <laughs> see, I think the more you lose faith in the ability of others. Um, so yeah, I've, I've become increasingly horrible to work with. I think I'll probably have no career again in about five years because it will have just become impossible. That's cool. I like being unemployed. Come sit on the couch with me. It'll be fun. The, uh, the, the thing I've relished moving into this role in my life. And I never thought I would because I was always the young guy, right? I was always the the youngest managing partner in a meeting or whatever. And uh, now that I'm the old guy and I'm hanging out here at Digital Wildcatters where everybody is 30 years old, Colin or Jake or one of the guys will run in and say, we're going to do this. And I'll say, no, you're not. And they'll go, well, why not? And I said, because I tried it in 07 and it didn't work. I forgot and tried it in 11. It didn't work then. And oh, by the way, just for good measure, I screwed it up in 19. And here's why it fails. And those guys are always like, oh, okay, I get it. I've actually kind of relished being the old guy because this, this volume of fuck ups that I've done throughout my life actually have value to people. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of been fun becoming the old guy. Yeah, I think it's one of the very few benefits of getting older. <laughs> Maybe the only one. Peeing early in the morning is the worst one. I will say that. Um, Tabitha, you were great coming on. Tell people, tell people where they can get the book, make the pitch for that. Well, the book is available at all good bookstores. It's also available on Amazon. Um, I think it's more available in by coastal bookstores. They uh, told me that they were sending most of them to New York and Los Angeles, but there are some in Dallas. Are you based in Dallas? I'm in Houston. Those were actually fighting words. That's, uh, the, yeah, I was about to say, dang it, we're, we were getting along so well. Oh, well. I had to send a few down to Texas because I thought it might interest people down there. Possibly they're in Houston. And I, yeah, yeah exactly. Dallas, but maybe there's an even split. But I did, I did ask for them to be, um, sent down to Texas. But, you know, there is always Amazon as well, um, if you're desperate. So the book is called Sea State. It's Tabitha Lasley, although that's L-A-S-L-E-Y, correct? And you were great to come on. I really appreciate our discussion. I enjoyed it. And anytime you want to come to Texas, have a book signing, have an event, we'd love to host you. Great. I remember that. Thank you so much for having me. 